Okay. So first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And I think it's a great idea to organize uh, online uh, seminars uh, these days. So what I'm going to present is a little bit of uh, uh, the work that I've been doing uh, in the past uh, 20 years in the area of network control systems. So that uh, is one of the area that has been uh, uh, more active and I don't think I have to spend too much time in uh, convincing you. And uh, the, the, the thing that I would like to stress is the area that I'm quite interested in is uh, where you want to communicate over wireless at uh, fairly high uh, bandwidth in terms of a packet per second in the order of kilohertz. And then to look at the problems that arise in this context when you have from few uh, agents, like for example, robots in field robotics, up to a very large number of, uh, for example, mobile devices. So I would like to start uh, uh, when I started working on this area, and that was about 20 years ago. And uh, we were at the beginning of uh, the area on network control system. And then we tried to look at a very simple problem. And uh, or the simplest problem you could think of when you have a digital communication uh, in a control system. Actually, uh, even simpler than control, like estimation problem, where you have uh, an, an an analog signal, oh, sorry, uh, I messed up, okay. Sorry, uh, you have an analog signal that uh, you somewhat transform and you quantize uh, into a number of bits that uh, you encode and then transmit over the digital network. And on the other side, you try to recover the packet possibly with some delay. And uh, at the time we were looking at the type of, uh, um, transmission or types of uh, communication you could have, uh, like Ethernet, Bluetooth, ZigBee. And then what we uh, realized is that uh, the number of bits you could send is very high. And therefore, we started with an assumption where quantization noise uh, is much smaller than the sensor noise. Also, that the packet rate is limited. Uh, so it's different from the bit rate. Uh, we'll come back to that later. And uh, we assumed also there was no transmission noise. So the data was either corrupted and is therefore dropped. And so basically the problem that we were looking at is what happens when some of the packets are not uh, received by the decoder and are uh, delayed by one time step. And uh, basically the problem that we were looking at is uh, what is the best estimate of the state when you transmit uh, the output of a linear system uh, corrupted by noise and uh, you try to estimate the state uh, given the information that is available. And then at each time step T, the uh, available information, if you think about having a buffer is uh, some of the packets, the previous measurement are stored and some other are simply lost, but you know where these packets are lost. So basically the modeling is very simple and we basically try to model the packet loss as a binary variable where one is when you receive the measurement and zero otherwise. And uh, basically what you have at the estimator is this Y tilde, which is basically the true measurement if you receive, otherwise you get a zero. This is not quite a zero measurement because you know that it's been lost. So it turns out that if you do this modeling, the optimal estimation at the estimator in terms of uh, uh, mean square error turns out to be a time varying Kalman filter. So something that uh, we know how to handle. And uh, basically we uh, published this work that uh, received uh, uh, quite uh, a bit uh, of, uh, of interest. And uh, basically the way that we, we address the problem is that you end up with a Kalman filter where you have this extra term, this gamma. So that basically tells you that when you don't receive the packet, you basically go open loop, given the model that you have. Otherwise you try to update the state uh, similar to what uh, a standard Kalman filter will do. The only difference is that this gain here is a time varying and does not converge to a steady state value. Also, another thing that uh, we observe is that we could find uh, some uh, 
sufficient condition for the stability of the error uh, covariance that was associated with uh, a modified Riccati equation where you have this factor here, one minus epsilon, where epsilon is the probability of losing a packet. And I think that the reason that this paper uh, got uh, uh, quite a bit of interest is that uh, it was a very simple model, but uh, was not a trivial. Also, we could relate the packet loss, the critical packet loss probability for stability to the eigenvalues of the matrix A. Also, we developed some uh, new mathematical tools that uh, have become uh, quite uh, uh, ubiquitous these days. And uh, the estimator was not designed only for stability, but also for performance. So we get, we get something else besides stability. But many problems uh, remain unanswered. And uh, I mentioned one. So basically, uh, after our work, there was another work by Gupta and co-authors, where basically they showed that rather than sending the raw measurement, you could put uh, a standard common filter at the transmitter, and then you should transmit uh, the estimated state. So basically what you will do at the estimator, so if you receive the estimated state, that actually the optimal uh, estimate of the state, if you don't receive it, you just go open loop with the previous value that you have of the received estimate. And differently from the approach that uh, just, sent, uh, just send uh, the measurements, when you receive uh, an estimate here, is like having received all the previous measurements. So potentially this uh, has a better performance. But one thing that uh, puzzled me and uh, is that uh, if you think about uh, these uh, uh, results, if you consider now a uh, multidimensional system, so now the state has dimension n, but the, the output is uh, just a scalar. So assume that the system is observable. So what you could show according to these tools and the results is that if you transmit the estimated state, and if you keep, for example, the eigenvalues of A just lightly a little bit bigger than one, well, you could make basically the critical pack, uh, probability very close to one. So you could almost lose all the packets and yet you will be able to recover a, a stable estimate. Why, if you transmit the raw measurement, you see that the critical probability does not depend on the maximum, eigenvalue, but the product of the unstable eigenvalues. So basically, if you have a very large n here, you can make this quantity arbitrarily closer to zero. So it means that unless you receive almost all packets, you cannot uh, reconstruct uh, a stable estimate. And this uh, kind of puzzled me because, you know, if n is huge, well, as I say, 1,000, let's say, uh, why is transmitting the state better than transmitting just a measurement? Because uh, uh, the, the answer is not trivial because you have to quantize the state. So if we have n is 10,000 here, you know, it's not obvious how you, you quantize the, the state rather than the measure. So one thing that is quite clear is that in order to answer this question, you need to include the quantization. So now let me look at the previous work on the area of network control communication. And there are different ways to model uh, communication. One is quantization, rate limitation, SNR limitation, packet loss, or delay. And there were some uh, people, some groups, uh, working at each problem separately. And then at some point, people started to put things together. So say, what happens when you have rate limitation and you add delay? Or what happens when you have packet loss and you consider delay? Or quantization and packet loss, also packet loss and SNR limitation, or rate limitation and packet loss. However, uh, there was nobody, at least at that time, that really looked at all these three problems simultaneously. So what happens when you have packet loss, SNR limitation that uh, uh, is a somewhat related either to quantization or rate limitation and delay. So we started to look at this problem a little bit more in depth. 
So I started working with some colleagues here in Padova, uh, with Alessandro Chiuso, who is an expert on stochastic identification, and I've paid also with uh, uh, two colleagues in the uh, communication uh, group, Andrea Zanella and Nicola Lauretti. And we wanted to go a little bit deeper and try to look at the problem, uh, uh, very simple problem. So let's now consider just a scalar system, unstable, but you have some process noise and some measurement noise, everything is Gaussian. And what we want to look is what happens when you have a real number, here you have to code it, so you transform into some number of bits. You transmit the bits over the channel, you recover some other bits that you have to decode and you have to decide basically what is the control in order to stabilize the plan. And the way that we try to approach this problem is not to try to design optimally the coder and the decoder. That's actually what, uh, uh, for example, Sahai uh, uh, and Mitter try to do with any time coding. But we try to look at slightly different and if you want suboptimal problem. We decide to say, okay, let's use what we have in terms of standard channel coding and decoding. What's goal is basically having some numbers here, real number, that you want to transmit over the channel. And from the other side, you would like to reconstruct this value transmitted here as better as, uh, as best as possible. So here, we are not trying to also to design the controller. We just forget, let's say, what happens when you try to reconstruct a real number when you transmit across the channel? So what we wanted to do is to try to avoid a, a digital analysis that is very difficult, although uh, in, in, in certain terms better because you really go down to the bit level. And we wanted to approximate uh, a digital channel. So basically what you have in a digital channel, at least at the high level, so you have S, which is the real number that you would like to transmit. You quantize it into a number of bits, you transmit, you encode these bits into other bits, you transmit uh, these bits over a noisy channel, you try to uh, decode those bits, and then uh, you try to uh, reconstruct some other real number, and hopefully with S very close to H. So let's uh, try to, uh, let me see why it's not, okay. So for example, here you have a number, suppose that you have a very simple quantizer, just a uniform quantizer with two bits. So you receive some real numbers and you quantize into two bits, in this case, one, zero. And let's forget for a second the quantization. So once you have the bits to transmit, uh, these are pretty much roughly what channel coding does. Where first of all, you would like to figure out at the receiver, whether the packet has been uh, transmitted uh, correctly or not. So basically, for example, the simplest thing you could do is uh, add a parity check bit. So basically you add all the bits here and you add the values. And also you would like to be a little bit more robust to the noise in the chart. So you add some redundancy. So for example, let's consider here just a simple uh, replication of the same bits three times. And you try basically to recover the bits by doing majority, uh, majority check. So these are the things that can happen at the receiver. So for example, suppose that some bits have been flipped. These three bits here have been flipped. So if you use a majority uh, check, basically here you recover a one, here you recover a zero, here you recover a one. If you look at the parity check, this is okay. So you decode correctly the, the two bits that were transmitted. The other thing that can happen is that, for example, here two bits have been flipped. And so when you do a majority code, one here bit has been transformed into one. But uh, using the parity check, you figure out that something happened and therefore you know that what you received is not the uh, transmitted bits and then you consider that as an erasure. So you know that the, the, some of the bits have been freed and you were not able to recover the correct bits. The other case that can happen is that some bits are flipped, but the way they're flipped are in such a way that now the 
parity check doesn't discover the error. And therefore, you believe that uh, the transmitted bits were 0, 1, but in reality, they are not. So in this case, you have a wrong decoding. So what you transmit here at the quantization, at the, at the, after the quantizer the transmitter is not is what is recovered after the uh, channel decoder. Also, another thing uh, that is important to bear in mind is that we assume that uh, the uh, decoder, the, uh, the receiver, knows the exact quantization we used at the transmitter. So basically, once you receive the one zero bits, uh, you know how to transform it into the corresponding real number here. Of course, there will be some quantization error, but uh, in terms of the difference between S T and Q and H, Q and T is the same. So, but let's see what a little bit uh, deeper what you could do with uh, uh, channel code. So one thing that you could do is that instead of sending the one uh, measurement, you wait. So instead of, uh, uh, okay, so, sorry, let me take it back. So that what I've just shown is that you have two bits to transmit, you transform with parity check and redundancy into nine bits per word. So basically I transmit nine bits per period. But what I could do is that I could wait one uh, time step, wait for the next measurement to arrive. And instead of transmitting nine bits, I transmit 18 bits using a longer block length. So the number of bits per second is always per period, sorry, is always the same. But uh, uh, what information theory uh, says is that uh, you could, uh, you are able to reduce the ratio probability at the price, of course, of a larger delay. So there is a trade-off here. If you use a block length that are longer, and so basically you are willing to increase the delay, you can reduce uh, the ratio probability. Okay, so let me go back instead to uh, the quantization. Okay, so how do you pick the quantization level? And so now let's think about S of T. So S of T is a real number that has some distribution. And here I show, I show you basically three different choices for the quantization. The blue one has a very fine quantization. But of course, uh, you might end up uh, in uh, saturating the signal. The green is instead by using very large quantization step. Uh, and therefore, here you end up having most of your S values within this area, but you make a very large error. And the red one is uh, somewhat uh, between the two. So if you look at uh, the quantization error, so the difference between the true value and the value that you will get with the quantization, you get these curves. So you see that here with the very low quantization step, I get a very low error if the, if the measurement, if S is here, but I get a very large value here. If I use the green one, of course I can increase this area in the middle, but I have a larger error. So if you look at the distribution of STQ at the output, given a certain Gaussian distribution of S, you see that if you pick the quantization error too small, that you end up with very long tails. Differently, if you use a very large quantization, that you end up with a very large error in between a very small outside. And you, intuitively, you, you imagine that uh, there is a somewhat an optimal choice for the quantizer. And indeed, uh, if we plot the variance of this uh, quantization error as a function of the quantization level, you, we have uh, a curve that looks like this. And there is a minimum here. So that's the optimal choice for the quantizer given a certain distribution of S of T. The minimum value that you get is the signal to quantization noise ratio. That's the minimum you can get with this specific quantizer. 
So basically, what we um, uh, ended up by looking at this is that the variance of the quantization noise is a scaled version of the power of the input signal, which is where rho is basically what relates these two signal, which is the signal to noise ratio. The other thing that we, we would like to add is that the quantization noise is just independent from the input. So in theory, this is not true because the quantization is a deterministic function of the input. But uh, there are several works that have shown that even with very few bits, uh, you can uh, safely assume uh, that uh, this quantization noise is uh, almost independent from the input. So here we have a model, an analog model for the quantization which looks additive, but is not additive because you see here that there is a, a dependence on the variance of this uh, quantization noise that is proportional to the power of the signal that comes in here. So although it looks additive, it's more like a multiplicative noise. And there's a very important impact later in the performance. So let's put everything together. And uh, let's see how basically we model this digital channel into a analog equivalent. So basically the quantization part is modeled as a quantization noise was power is proportional to the power of the input signal. The finite code length is modeled as a delay D, which is an integer. So you use a longer code length you might end up with a lower ratio probability epsilon here, but of course you have a longer delay. So here, these are the three very important ingredients that we are going to use. So a ratio probability, the signal to quantization noise ratio, and the decoding delay. There is also the probability of having a wrong decoding, but uh, the way that uh, um, um, coding is performed today is, uh, is, such, is done in such a way that the probability of getting a wrong decoding is really, really tiny. So it's like having an impulse disturbance from time to time. So we can safely neglect it in terms uh, of uh, average performance. Oh, by the way, if you have any question or something is not clear, please stop me. Okay, uh, I continue. Okay, so basically, if you remember here, we had the channel, but we have replaced it with this analog equivalent where I have the quantization noise, the erasure channel here and some delay. And to make the things even simpler, we forget about a possible coding of the measurement, but we just assume that we take the measure and we forward it. At the other side, we received a delayed and quantized version of the measurement, or we could get no measurement at all if there is an erasure. And what we want to do is to use this information to build a controller. And the way we want to build the controller is to use a simple linear state predictor followed by a linear state feedback. So this is not necessarily the optimal strategy, but we decided to do this because we can analyze the system. So let me go a little bit more in detail. So basically, since we have a delay of these steps, in order to model the system, we need to look at the documented system. So here, there is nothing really deep here. We just augmented the, with the delays here. What you measure is the delayed version of the state. So sorry, Y is the measurement at XT, but what you receive, this H of T, is the delayed version of the state. And uh, what we want to use, uh, as I was mentioning before, 
I'm considering a linear estimator similar to a Canon filter where you take H and you compare what you could predict H. And uh, if you receive the, this value, you try to compensate for your estimate. And then once you have this estimate of the state, you use just a standard linear feedback. As for performance, we want to look at the LQG performance. So we would like to minimize over G and L the square of the power of Y plus the square of the input times some R. R is basically a parameter that basically uh, trade off uh, speed, if you want, or performance in terms of. Uh, estimation error and uh, input uh, energy used to do it. But uh, as I was mentioned before, one important aspect here is that we have this constraint. So the power of the quantization noise depends on Y. So this actually is a very important constraint that will couple everything. So here I just rewrote the equation that I showed before. And uh, basically, if you see here, if P you define as the variance of the estimated state and the estimation error, then you end up with some quadratic uh, function in the gains G and L, which is linear in the covariance matrix. So for the way it is built, it's possible to actually compute explicitly what this M here is. So I can compute uh, uh, this uh, function. So if you fix G and L, I can compute the P if it exists. So the problem is here is to optimize the gains. Okay. And the way we do it is to use a Lagrangian. So basically we add the constraint P equal to M of P by adding a Lagrangian. We try to find the necessary optimal condition and basically what you end up with is a set of coupled Riccati-like equations where P is the error, error in state of covariance, gamma is the, uh, the Lagrangian uh, multipliers, you see that these are coupled, and G and L basically are function of P and lambda. And the problem is uh, uh, quite complex, but uh, we were lucky that uh, we were able to show that this L and G, which are vectors, actually has a very nice structure. So basically the L is a bunch of zero times a scalar and G needs to have this structure where A is known and the only basic and known parameter is G. So basically we have uh, recasted the problem in trying to solve this uh, Riccatic uh, like equation, we were we have two unknown parameters, which are scalars. And fortunately, by setting R to zero, so basically by considering the uh, cheap uh, control problem, it's, we were able to actually compute explicitly what is P and lambda G and L. And you end up with this very simple Riccati-like equation that uh, is very simple to analyze because we already studied that uh, where we consider the simple problem, we only packet uh, uh, probability. And basically we are able to show that uh, the necessary and sufficient condition for this couple Riccati equation is given by this quantity. And uh, this is a very simple expression that puts together all the three ingredients that I mentioned before. So epsilon is the ratio of probability. Alpha is the inverse of the signal to noise ratio. So it's basically the noise to signal ratio. And D is the decoding delay. What was very nice is that uh, with this uh, simple equation, we could recover a number of results available, already available in uh, the literature. So for example, if we set the quantization noise to zero and we consider no delay, we find this expression, which was actually the condition that we find in our original paper. 
If we consider infinite resolution but delay, we basically get exactly the same uh, condition, which actually was uh, also shown uh, in a paper that uh, I published earlier. So that I showed uh, that delay was not relevant for stability. Of course, it's relevant for performance, but in terms of stability, it doesn't play any role. Also, we were, could look at uh, what people uh, have tried to uh, analyze uh, and in terms of what happens when you consider only basically uh, signal to noise constraints in the channel. So basically you cannot transmit a signal at arbitrary power. And so basically if we set epsilon to zero, we consider no delay, we find that this condition that uh, was the condition found in uh, Braslaski and co-authors. Sorry, Luca. Yes. I can I ask you uh, one question? So yes. for this last, uh, for this last result, the uh, distribution of the noise is Gaussian. No, is that correct? This is the second moment. So the distribution. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the number, the, the number, the number three. Number three, I think they put the Gaussian noise. I don't know if the distribution is Gaussian. But uh, the second moment uh, stability condition is given by the expression there. Yes. Yeah, so, so my question is uh, whether you also are assuming n to be Gaussian or not to 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 recover the result number three of Braslaski, uh, 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 Middleton, and the no. Redenberg. So right now I'm just looking at second moment. So I don't know oh. whether the distribution is Gaussian or not. Okay. Okay. I'm just computing the second moment, and that's the, the equation that you get. But your question right. is very interesting, but I, I will come back in a couple of slides to that. Okay, thanks. Any other question? Okay, so also, if you use this expression that uh, relates the rate with the signal to noise ratio, so this is a kind of approximation are basically related results where you have rate constraint with result where you have a signal to noise ratio constraint. And recalling that the rate needs to be smaller than the capacity, we find exactly the same result that was originally found uh, in, uh, by Tati Konda and Mitter in their uh, very early paper. Also, uh, we could look at what happens when you have no packet loss and delay D equal to one. That was the, the scenario that Braslaski also and co-authors considered some few years later. And we find exactly the same condition. Also, there was another paper where basically they look at infinite resolution, but they added uh, basically packet loss as an SNR limitation and they added delay by this work by Silva and Pulgar, and they found basically this condition. Actually, we found uh, using our result that the condition they have is uh, more conservative and actually we can go a little bit lower than that. So basically we were able somewhat also to recover their result. Also, there is a very, another very nice paper by Minero and co-authors where they look at the problem of the rate limitation where basically you jump from one rate to zero. So you could have either some, some limited rate or you could have no rate at all. So you cannot transmit any bit at all. And you assume that this is a binary variable and here is the, the condition that they get. So basically, again, if you use the same expression, we plug in to their condition and this expression, we end up by obtaining exactly the same the condition that we have. I would like, however, to stress uh, that uh, this is not uh, somewhat uh, the definite uh, answer to the problem on how you design coding and decoding to stabilize an unstable plant. Because if you remember, we try to simplify the problem by considering what people do in channel coding and decoding today. So they don't take into account the fact that you would like to stabilize an unstable plant. So potentially you could do better by considering the problem uh, at its very core. This is actually what uh, uh, Sai and Mitter try to do. Okay, 
So what is the role of the capacity? Because many of the results were related to the capacity. So let's look at the three parameters that I've been playing with, which is the signal to quantization noise ratio, the coding delay, and the ratio probability. So these quantities are not independent. If you remember that when I was mentioning using longer code length, that you will be able to reduce this, but of course you increase D. And you can also, for example, use a coarser quantizer in order to set more bits per second and the four, for example, reducing D. So basically, the problem that you would like to solve is what is the largest unstable system that I can stabilize uh, given a certain capacity? And this is not an easy problem uh, to answer. And actually, we don't know the answer. So basically, what you would like to do is to maximize you know, the most unstable plant given the condition that we have and given the fact that these parameters are not free, but they need to be constrained by the capacity of the child. So this is still an open problem. Okay. So uh, here I was considering by sending the raw measurement. And the question is, could I do better than that? So can I do some, some coding before? And the answer is uh, actually yes. And this is the work that I've been done doing with Alessandro Chiuso and Subracan today. And let's look at the problem of transmitting just uh, a, a, the Y here, where you potentially could transform this uh, measurement in some other signal. Then you quantize it, you code it into bits, you decode it these bits, uh, you transform again into some uh, real number, then you try to we try to recover somewhat the inverse of this. And the idea of uh, uh, using a smarter coding is a, a very, uh, very old uh, idea. And so suppose that you want to transmit the blue signal. Rather than transmitting the blue signal, you try to transmit just the difference between two samples. And you will get this black signal, which has a much smaller amplitude. And therefore you can encode it with uh, uh, smaller bits, or if you want it, you can encode it with a higher resolution. And at the other side, basically, the only way, I mean, the way to recover the blue is just to add what you receive. So you have this delta sigma modulation that is uh, also known as differential pulse cost modulation, which is old as old as the 50. The idea here, if you look at the, at the, the, the problem is that basically what you do here, you have exactly the same copy of the filter that the receiver. And what you do is you do the, the difference between what the receiver believes uh, to be the state and what actually is the true state. So this is basically the same idea that we try to employ. And what we did is that we assume to model the digital channel as before. So some quantization noise, a ratio of probability, and we consider two scenarios. One where the basically the transmitter knows whether the packet has been received or not by the receiver, and the other where there is no acknowledgement. And again, is a, you want to minimize basically the error variance there. So in the first case, uh, when you know if the packet has been received or not by the receiver, basically it turns out that the information set at the transmitter includes the information set at the receiver. And therefore, as I was showing before, I can basically replicate exactly the same filter that I have at the, the receiver. Now the problem is that which filter should I use? And the filter you should use is that here, the transmitter, you take the measurement and you first you compute the optimal state using a standard common filter. And then here, what you transmit is the difference between the optimal state estimated at the transmitter and what the receiver will try to predict. So basically here, you just send the difference. If a packet is lost, nothing is really lost because here you know that the receiver will not receive it and therefore you will keep on increasing here basically the error. And therefore, basically that's the optimal strategy. If you don't have a feedback, 
uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but the problem is that there is no optimal solution here. So basically here you have to resort, resort to some uh, heuristics. And the heuristics that we look at is that uh, one is to just forward the state estimate without knowing whether the packet is being received or not. The third, the second one is to do just uh, the, so if you want the uh, sigma delta decoding by assuming and transmitting that all the packets are received, which is of course wrong. So this quantity here will not be equal to this one. And the other is a, a very straightforward idea. Basically you try to do a, conv I mean a convex combination between the case where you don't use the state uh, estimate or you use it with some, uh, uh, soft value which basically is given by the average packet loss of probability. And here is what you get uh, when you look at the, the performance as a function of the packet loss probability. So the, basically the purple curve is what you get if you do have feedback. And so that's the optimal strategy here. You see this the lowest part. If you in, send just the innovation, you see that here at the beginning is very good, but then it becomes much smaller than sending just the, 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 the state forward. If you do the soft, uh, uh, the soft approach as before, you do better than the two. But this is uh, interesting because if you now go back and you look at the problem that uh, uh, the result that uh, 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 Gupta, uh, proved is that if you send the estimate, that's a better strategy than sending just the measurement. So if you look at the performance where you have a very large signal to noise ratio, this is actually what you get. So sending the Kalman estimate, so the, the approach to is better than sending just the measure. But when you start uh, decreasing the number of bits that you use, for example, here you see on the right, when you use a, a signal to quantization noise ratio of 10, it turns out that sending the Kalman estimate turns out to be worse than sending the rose measurement. So actually this is saying that uh, where, what you have to send a transmitter becomes not so obvious when you have quantization, uh, packet loss and delay altogether. Okay. Another problem that, uh, oh, any question on this part? Okay, maybe I'm, I just go ahead and then maybe you can ask a uh, question later. So now I go, I uh, come back to the question that I was asked before about uh, distributions. So one problem also that puzzled me is that whether mean square stability is actually relevant for this type of network control system. So now let's look again to the simple problem with the scalar system where you have a packet loss here. So you transmit uh, uh, the state and you assume that you have no measurement noise. And in terms of control, you do just a, a linear feedback. And what you want to look at is a the second moment, so the square uh, error, if you want. And epsilon is again the packet loss of probability that I mentioned before. So it turns out this is a very simple system for which you can compute uh, the evolution of the second moment that has uh, this expression. And you see here that there is nothing random anymore. So there is the packet loss probability and the uh, control gain that you want to use. And therefore, the mean square stability condition is given by this quantity being smaller than one. So let's consider the case where you have epsilon equal to zero. So that's uh, the case where you have a standard stochastic linear system for which we know that uh, the stability condition is a minus k smaller than one. And in fact, uh, if I try to do some simulation of this stochastic system where I use a k in such a way, the system is slightly unstable and K where is slightly stable. So this condition is slightly violated and the one is slightly satisfied. And you see that the, these are uh, 10 different realization of the system. You see that you get something that what you expect. 
But look now what happens when now you consider packet loss and to make things simpler, assume that K is equal to A. So you try to kill basically the state. So now the mean square stability becomes epsilon A squared minus one, which is the one that uh, basically covered one of our earlier results. But now let's look at what happens when you try to simulate these two systems where one, you have this condition slightly violated and the other one is slightly not violated. And you see here, something really bizarre happens. You don't see a clear difference between the two and also it looks like it's stable. They are both stable. So what's happening here? And what's happening here is that uh, basically you have a stochastic switching linear system where one system is unstable. And there is a very nice uh, uh, work done uh, in the 80s uh, related to stochastic equation in this type of system. And also the, uh, the many authors work on this uh, implicit renewal theory, basically where they were able to show that in such a case, uh, the distribution is not Gaussian, but it's heavy tail. So that means that the second moment is not a very good uh, uh, measurement for the uh, evolution of your system. And in fact, uh, if, you look of the, if you look at the results from these works, you can see that if you look at, at the stability region in terms of the control gain and the packet loss probability, the condition for the existence of a steady state error distribution is much larger than the condition on the second moment stability. But uh, what is important uh, is uh, the actual distribution, which is heavy tail. So that means that even if uh, the, most of the, of the trajectories, they will basically oscillate around zero, you will have uh, very large spikes here. So basically what I plotted here are two different realization for one where is a system as a, a Gaussian distribution and the other was as a power law distribution with the same second moment. And you see that you, know, you have these bad spikes and you can imagine that this can be very, very, uh, uh, is very relevant when you have, uh, you, you want to ensure safety in control system. So going back uh, to look at these results and uh, uh, you know, network control system is one of the most active and cited area in control, but the impact of industry is very marginal. And uh, I, one of the reasons I try to think about the reasons is that one problem is that we probably focus on one objective, which is stability, which is not what we really have to focus. Well, although we use the right tools, so more the base control. Also in the industry, people are basically attached to legacy systems. Therefore, then they, will not, they don't want to change or use very sophisticated methods. Also because before it was not possible to implement this control over wireless. But things are going to change in industry 4.0. Also, for example, in the area of uh, uh, manned air vehicles where you want to use multiple vehicles for infrastructure maintenance, load transportation. And there are many challenges that I think we need to face. For example, multi-agent cooperation of the loss network uh, look at bandwidth around one kilohertz and the adaptive communication for control. So I just want to, in the last uh, three minutes, four minutes that I'm left, uh, I just want to show you some preliminary results on, uh, on uh, this direction. And the first is uh, how to show that actually you can do control over wireless at a very high frequency. And this is the work uh, with some uh, people here in Padova. And basically what we try to do is to basically get uh, uh, off-the-shelf devices and we built basically a segue with uh, gyros accelerometers of wheel and cooler with a Raspberry Pi uh, controller here. And basically what we try to do is to remotely stabilize the system. So basically all the control is on a remote plate. And what we did, we use basically the best tools Uh, yeah, uh, I'll maybe look at the chat later, oh, sorry. 
um, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, basically, what we did is basically we used the best that is out there. So basically, we use a buffered Kalman filter to estimate the state, and we use packetized uh, control. So we use something like a model predictive control. So basically, instead of sending just one uh, uh, control input, we try to predict what should be the control input to be applied the next time step. So when the planter does not receive it, we'll use the second. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I just want to show some uh, uh, experimental results that uh, we had with real data using Wi-Fi, where we collected data in almost an industrial environment where there were also other Wi-Fi available. And so here, basically, you see the packet delay cumulative distribution. And you see here that basically most of the packets are received between a 10 time step, but there is a, a non negligible packet loss a probability around 50%. The other thing that is very important is here, here, if you look at now the probability density, so what is the probability of a packet being delayed? You see that here, you don't get a, an exponential distribution, but you get this kind of, again, heavy tail distribution that actually turns out to be quite uh, evident. If you look at the single realization here that you see on the left, where basically for 30 seconds, we look at the packet delay and you see that sometimes there are very huge delays due to network congestion, or you could have these burst losses from time to time. So basically what you see here on the bottom is uh, the average packet loss over the last 30 packets. So packet losses and delays are not ideal and are not Markovian either. So you need to be careful when you try to do control not taking into account this consideration. And here I just want to show uh, an experimental uh, results. But basically here on the left, we have an approach which is called the emulation base. So it's a very naive way to do it. Basically, basically, if you lose a packet, you just replace uh, uh, the control with the, the last use control. And on the right, instead, the one we try to do all this model-based prediction. And then you see that the oscillation is much lower and also much more robust, because you will see that at some point, the one on the left will collapse, while the other is much more robust to these packet losses. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. Uh, let, let me skip this part. I just want to, uh, to stress the fact that it is, that is important that we shift from stability to safe control. So try to basically enforce controller that maintains constraints because trying to stabilize an unstable plant using a remote control is really crazy because you will never get rid of blackouts or period of time where the channel is really bad. And therefore, no matter what you do, the system will fail. And here there is some preliminary result that I would like to skip. And I'll just go to the conclusion, trying to uh, stress a couple of things. For, first of all, I think it's important that uh, we need to look at the realistic assumption in particular for communication. So IID or Gaussian distribution is not something that uh, happens in reality. Also, the good news is that actually Wi-Fi is suitable for one kilohertz application. And I just show you with experimental results. And also 5G is coming. So I think in more uh, experimental work is needed to convince uh, industry to look at this uh, uh, community. Also important to move from stability to safety in control over wireless. And another area which is actually quite pristine is what you do when you have multiple agents that need to cooperate with each other using wireless. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, some of the papers uh, can be found on my homepage. And uh, sorry if it took a couple of minutes more. If you have any questions, I'll be glad uh, to answer.